Okay. Here we go. Welcome back, everybody. Ooh. And the crowd falls to a gentle hush. Just right for a Friday fall afternoon and, or morning in Washington, D.C. Thanks for all coming back, and uh, actually, thanks for all hanging around. Hope the break was good. Certainly by the conversation, it was pretty lively. Uh, I'm still learning my way around uh, Archives One, and uh, so there I was lost a little bit. Uh, and I know my staff will say, how could, how could they tell? But um, uh, I heard the, con the, the conference uh, even a couple of uh, walls away, as I was, and that helped me find my way back here. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is great. Uh, so the morning's been, been uh, effective. I have one little bit to clear up here. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned to me how uh, my story previously kind of resonated with them, and I just want to underscore then support multiple celebrations of multiple days of birthdays. <laughs> You know, it's like the vote early, vote often methodology. Yeah, so that's, that's a good thing to do. Uh, we're going to turn now from uh, what I thought was an excellent overview from Doris in terms of the big questions facing preservation professionals and how it relates to access and discovery and the taking in of records. Uh, I thought that was a great talk, Doris. Thank you. Um, uh, so now we're actually going to turn it from the big picture theory parts of uh, what's happening to actual experience with the um, items themselves and how do we do that voodoo we do so well. Uh, so I, I can't help it. Um, so I want you all to be um, uh, thinking about that. You know, when we go from the theory of access and preservation and how they intersect and how those connections take us from the home to the business, to the responsibility of stewarding the records of the republic, sort of an interesting paradigm there. Uh, the people who do the work are exquisite. And for those folks who are NARA staff who are involved in this process across the agency, I'm grateful for your work. It is something that impresses me every day as an employee of the National Archives, the commitment and the skill and the dedication to preserving our nation's history that happens here every day. So that's something that personally I'm grateful to you for. So let me turn it over to folks who know what they're doing. Uh, I'd like to introduce, um, I'm gonna introduce all the speakers before the talk starts up. And then just to remind you, hold your um, comments and questions till after the talk, microphones on either side. Um, I think that you may be very entertained by this. So uh, first up, uh, well, there'll be a group. Amy Lubick joined the staff of the National Archives and Records Administration as a paper conservator in 2006. She became conservation digitization coordinator in 2010. And from 2002 to 2006, she was a contract conservator at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Prior to that, she completed a postgraduate internship with the National Park Service and White House Archives. Amy received an Master's in Certificate of Advanced Study in Art Conservation with specialization in paper and a BA in Art History from the State University of New York College at Buffalo. She has presented on NARA's digitization activities for various audiences, including the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works Annual Conference. Sarah Spargel, Senior Photograph Conservator, joined the National Archives in 2006. From 2003 to 2006, she was a photograph conservator at the Library of Congress. I think they're just over that away. Prior to that, she completed the Advanced Residency Program in Photograph Conservation as an Andrew W. w. Mellon Fellow at the George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film. Sarah received a Master's in Certificate of Advanced Study in Art Conservation with specialization in photographic materials and paper from the State University of New York College at Buffalo and a BA in Art Conservation from the University of Delaware. She has presented and published on the topics of environmental management, treatment of photographic buttons, and the photographic and printmaking processes of Clarence H. White and contributed to the AIC Photographic Materials Group publication, Coatings on Photographs. Susan Page joined the staff of the National Archives and Records Administration as senior paper conservator in 1987. From 1979 until 1987, she worked as a paper conservator and head of the phased conservation section at the Library of Congress. Prior to that, she completed a master's degree at the George Washington University in museum studies. 
Susan received a master's in art from the University of California, Berkeley, and Susan specialized in conservation of cartographic materials. Please join me in welcoming this impressive group of people. The National Archives Conservation Lab has always had interesting challenges in preserving records for today and future use. Sarah, Susan, and I are going to share with you examples of work performed by the Conservation Lab that highlight the new and different directions the lab currently finds itself headed in. Some things have remained constant through the years. The lab receives both large and small objects um, that we treat individual items and large batches of records. Um, as you see, our conservation staff has the ability, you will see after our talks are finished, um, the, the ability and skills to adapt to the work needed. Working collaboratively with the various archival units and our exhibit staff, we establish our annual treatment priorities. And I just want to point out a couple of the images that we're looking at right now. On the left is a daguerreotype. It's uh, from the Widow's Certificates Pension Files Project. It's a current digitization project that we're working on right now. And this photo measures approximately two and three quarters by three and a half inches, so rather small. And on the right, we have a Russian anti-German propaganda poster. And this poster is quite large. It measures 36 inches by 92 inches. And Sarah Spargel is going to tell you more about the Russian poster project during her portion of the presentation. The first project we're going to share with you is a multi-year endeavor of oversized maps for the NARA Central Plains Field Office in Kansas City, Missouri. Our field office's conservator, Ann Witte, has been treating the collection of about 18 maps over the last several years. And each map measures about three and a half feet by 10 feet. These maps are of great interest to our researchers because they depict the Missouri River circa 1879 at an extremely detailed level, and the scale is about one inch to 1,000 feet. This level of detail provides a clear picture of river depths, riverbank habitats, and settlement patterns. The Lewis and Clark Bicentennial increased public awareness and interest in the route of the Missouri River as it existed before channelization and damming that began in the 20th century. So little did we know that when we began this project, it would span the use of film-based photography for reproduction through the transition to digital photography as the medium for reproduction here at the National Archives. When the maps first came to the National Archives, they were in very poor condition and could not be safely accessed for use. The map currently in the lab is North Washington, Missouri to Bates Island, which you see here. And this map happens to be in the worst condition of all the maps. The initial goal for this map was to unroll it, open it up so that interim reference photographs could be taken and sent to Kansas City for reference requests while the map was in the DC area for treatment. The map was rolled and lined with cloth. The back of the map was also covered with two inch wide uh, heavy duty industrial tape that you see here. And this tape was so stiff that it was impossible to unroll the map without causing additional damage to the map. So Anne removed approximately, she weighed this, two pounds of this heavy duty tape from the map so that it could be unrolled. And what Anne discovered when the map was unrolled was that it was mended extensively on the front with pressure sensitive tape and that it was severely distorted. So Anne humidified and flattened the map and reduced surface soil on the front, and you see her doing that on the right. At this point, the map was photographed in sections by NAR staff using 4 by 5 color transparency film. And these transparencies serve as the interim reference photos for Kansas City. The map was previously torn into four pieces, and so it was treated in individual sections for safer handling and easier handling. Each section was immersed in an ethanol bath to reduce the dark tape stains. So on the right is one of the polyester trays after a map section was bathed in ethanol. And once the ethanol evaporated, then you could see that this left this visible adhesive residue behind. On the left is one of the map sections after bathing in the ethanol. And you can see that the tape stains are a lot lighter 
but they're not completely gone. Next steps will include mending tears and rejoining the four sections of the map. An overall lining will be applied to the map as you see in this photo on the right. And the completed map will be imaged by the NARA Digital Lab on our large format scanner so that uh, digital images can be accessed by the researchers. The map will be returned to Kansas City flat and stored at the Lee Summit facility with the other treated maps in a custom housing fabricated in the conservation lab. And on the left is the storage location in Lee's Summit. The housing sits on top of several map cases located in the uh, Archival Bay. On the right is one of the previously treated maps displayed in Kansas City, its big exhibit, which was the inaugural exhibit for a newly constructed building. The treatment approach for these maps remains the same, even though our method and format for photographing these large objects has changed. The digitization of NARA Holdings is a fairly new initiative that drives a good quantity of the work completed in the conservation lab. With numerous internal and external digital projects occurring simultaneously on several different groups of records, the conservation, quickly, conservation lab quickly learned about five years ago that we needed to streamline our work processes to get records ready for imaging. And previously, the conservation lab was working on re preparing records for microfilming. And the work of stabilizing records for imaging, regardless of the format that they're captured in, is similar. But unlike several years ago, there's an ever-increasing demand to make original documents available online and more easily accessible. So NARA's external partnerships are helping the agency to meet goals in the number of images that are appearing online. The quantity of digital projects going on at any one time here at NARA is more than ever before. When NARA's conservation lab looks toward the future, we see digitization continuing to command much of the work that we do. The role of the conservation lab uh, plays in digitization here at NARA is very important. We assess the condition of the records when a series is proposed for imaging. So a written report is generated, ad addressed to the archival unit in charge of the records for the potential project. The report will contain comments on the current condition of the records, recommendations for the type of equipment to be used for imaging, the initial prep work that needs to be completed by NARA staff or volunteers to make the records camera ready, and an estimate of the number of conservation treatment hours needed to prepare the documents for digitization. And these are just um, a couple of pages of the uh, record assessments that we've completed. I'm sorry that the, that the text looks so funny there. The records proposed can vary widely in condition from one entry to the next, and within the same entry, depending on the level of use the records are exposed to or how the records were stored and cared for uh, prior to reaching the National Archives. If a group of records is in such poor condition that it would take thousands of hours to get the records to the point where they could be safely handled for imaging, we would recommend that the project should be set aside until adequate resources could be found to tackle the project. Uh, the containers that you see here are both in fairly poor condition. And the good news is that the box on the left that you see uh, was treated last year for imaging. And it was one of three containers in the series, all in similar condition. And it was digitized by NARA's conservation lab. I'm sorry, NARA's digital lab. The box on the right has been set aside for now because it's part of a larger series with many containers filled with documents in similar condition. And it may be difficult to see in the image, but these folded documents on the right are very pulpy and deteriorated, making them difficult to even lift them out of the box. Uh, the records on the left were in a little bit better condition, but they were all folded. They required humid humidification and flattening so that they could be imaged. So it was still a lot of treatment hours to get those records ready. Uh, during FY 2012, NARA's conservation lab spent approximately 4,200 hours involved in digitization activities, and about 2,500 of these hours were devoted to actual conservation treatment. Among other activities, these hours also reflect time spent completing the record assessments that I mentioned earlier, and training staff and volunteers um, to prepare and image the records. So what exactly are we doing in the conservation lab to streamline our work processes? 
uh, well, we're trying to do as little work as possible. And what I mean by that is that with 10 <laughs> billion textual documents and counting, the NARA Conservation Lab can't perform conservation treatment on each and every document before it gets considered for digitization. So if we can reduce the number of treatments and time spent on any particular document, it means we can treat more documents. For example, placing a partially torn document in a polyester sleeve may be an option to stabilize it and will mean that the document would not require mending for imaging. So this is a shortcut of sorts to treatment and we are learning to employ other time-saving techniques in the lab. Another technique to save time in carrying out minimal, is carrying out minimal mending on torn documents. And this level of stabilization is for documents that can't be placed in polyester sleeves with satisfactory results. If placed in a sleeve, this type of document would still be at risk and complete image capture uh, would not be guaranteed. So the mending needs only to be at a level acceptable for safe handling during digitization. Basically, we need to be able to pick up that record and move it from its container to the camera plat platen and back. And so we often call this partial mending or a band-aid approach to mending. Um, and we recognize that this, this same level of treatment would not be acceptable for documents that are slated for exhibit or for loan. Developing faster methods for the lab's approach to mending has significantly increased the number of documents that we treat in the lab each week. Now our conservators and technicians have recently experimented with using more heat set tissue for mending as opposed to the more traditional method of using wheat starch paste and Japanese paper. We've been making our own heat set tissue in the lab um, on a very thin machine made COZO paper that when we place it over text, we can still read the text through the documents. We've also been purchasing some heavier heat set tissue uh, that we use on the back of documents where there isn't any what we call unique text. And the heat set tissue has proved to be speedier to apply. It uh, avoids the long wait times for the wheat starch paste and uh, men's to dry. Among other techniques streamlined for digital projects that we may consider is a method for loosening tightly bound volumes. We currently have a uh, digital project of records from the Confederate States of America in the lab, and NARA book and paper conservator Stephen Lowe has been working with these bound records, one of which you see here on the left. And these are, they are sewn together so tightly that it means information is obscured in the gutters of these, of these books. When we prepare records for digitization, we would like as much unique information to be visible in the images as possible. We would like to reduce the likelihood that these materials would be requested by researchers uh, because they're unable to see all of the information contained in the record. And this can also be an issue for records held together with ribbons or records with glued attachments like you see on the right. And probably I would say roughly half of the, the treatment performed on the records uh, for digital projects include separating glued attachments and removing ribbons to access this unique information. When all unique information is not visible in an image, we often insert what we call a slug into the image to alert the viewer that this is the best image we are able to capture. And you can see an example of that um, on the left. Different records call for different treatments, so when dealing with bound materials, we may consider what Stephen is doing with the Confederate volumes for future projects. And this might involve cutting over sewing, uh, removing cloth hinges, and removing adhesive and linings from the spine to allow books with tight sewing to open more easily and wider to capture more information. And this approach has been very successful for the Confederate volumes project. We've been able to access more information from each tightly bound volume without having to take it apart completely. So in the photo on the right, you see one of the Confederate volumes that uh, Stephen has completed, um, loosening the volume. And post-imaging repairs would include rehinging this partially detached cover. Our approach to large-scale digitization projects, where many items require conservation intervention, is to set up an assembly line of several documents on a bench. And this allows the conservator or the technician to work back and forth more efficiently among several records while uh, waiting for adhesives to soften or men's and humidified documents to dry.
And not only are we thinking about new approaches to conservation treatment in the lab, but we're putting quite a bit of effort into thinking about the tools and the equipment used by prep staff and the digital camera operators. We're finding that by employing special tools, we're helping both the conservators reduce their treatment time in the lab and helping the camera operators capture quality images at their stations. So the tools I'm going to describe help us deal with materials like what you see on the screen, uh, distorted documents and bound volumes that have foldouts. So for the prep staff, we use a system of flagging uh, records in need of conservation treatment. And currently we're using a color-coded tabbing system to indicate preservation and pink tabs, pink for preservation. Pink sheets attached to the outside of the container uh, com are completed by the prep staff and they inc can include critical information such as a volume number, a page or certificate number, uh, name, date, or other indicator leading to the conservation concern. And prep notes on the pink sheet may also detail the conservation work that needs to be completed. Inside the containers, the pink flags will alert us to the exact location of a record requiring conservation attention. It's a fairly simple system, uh, but it allows the conservator to quickly locate the problem document and tend to the conservation issue, saving valuable time. The pink sheet on the outside of the box is a uh, helpful backup to the flags in case a pink tab is misplaced in the container or a conservation issue is not immediately identifiable. Looking to reduce the amount of conservation work per document imaged, we have repurposed some of NARA's old microfilm equipment. We realize the majority of, of NARA's holdings can't be imaged uh, using a flatbed scanner. You know, they're simply, most records are not eight and a half by 11 or legal size, and they're not single flat sheets. As we've previously mentioned, uh, we have records fastened with ribbons, seals, and glue. We have adhered attachments, bound records, a lot of oversized items and distorted records. So these old uh, tables from my, the microfilming days uh, offer a built-in book cradle and hinge glass for imaging bound materials and documents that aren't completely flat. For example, the microfilm tables have worked really well with projects involving bundles of trifolded records. In addition to the hinged glass tables, we've researched and designed our own hinge platen system to gently restrain distorted records up to a quarter of an inch in thickness. And this platen, placed at a planetary camera station, increases the versatility of that station and the various record formats that can be captured by that particular camera. Using hinge glazing to aid in imaging distorted records has saved countless hours in humidifying and flattening documents in the conservation lab. We've also recycled hundreds of pieces of acrylic from frames used originally in NARA exhibits to flatten folded records overnight. The conservation department has trained volunteers in the appropriate methods to carefully unfold documents, folder them, and weight them to make them more manageable at the camera the next day. And this technique of gentle overnight weighting means that there's less, ri ri less risk for damaging these documents when they're handled at the camera. When a microfilm table book cradle is too small, for a large volume or the volume cannot open 180 degrees, a corrugated book cradle can be the perfect solution for imaging. And the conservation lab has developed numerous designs of corrugated cradles. These cradles are custom made to accommodate volumes both big and small. Magnets and polyethylene strapping have been incorporated into the designs to hold records uh, in place. Holding records in place during imaging uh, is another challenge for us. With the proper, creative, and careful use of small weights for restraining documents, we can prevent the separation of a large number of adhered attachments. Bean bags filled with copper shot, uh, various drapery weights, and weights originally used for sewing applications have all been employed at internal and external partner camera stations. The bean bags and the drapery weights that you see in these images have cotton covers that unfortunately do present a maintenance issue for us. The records are often soiled and cause the weights to get quite dirty pretty quickly. So we've had volunteers sewing replacement covers for the weights, um, but we still need to frequently, frequently launder these covers. 
requiring less maintenance are small plastic coated weights. And the weight in the image on the left is no longer being manufactured. And they've become, so they've become increasingly difficult to find. So we recently experimented with dipping some vintage uh, pattern weights acquired on eBay in plastic dip, and that's what you're seeing on the right. These compact weights have a smaller profile. They cover less of the documents, and they can be easily wiped clean. So we're still testing these out, um, but we hope to get them to the project stations in the near future. Coordinating digitization efforts in an agency as large as NARA is not easy. We're looking toward the future and concentrating on how we can be more efficient in our work without jeopardizing the very documents that we're trying to protect. And digitization is just one of the 21st century challenges that we're facing in conservation. So I'll now turn the program over to Sarah Spargel, and she's going to share her projects with you and her challenges.